Hi, this is Jack Bobo, and I'm just waiting for a few more people to join in uh, before we get started. I think a new pastime with Zoom is for people to, when they do have a few moments, to try to look at people's bookshelves and see what books they can find. Uh, unfortunately, I've got sort of the history section behind me and all my books on uh, food are on the other side of uh, the room. So I'll have to make sure that I, I reorient the camera the next time we do this. So we're, we're building up. Uh, we've got about uh, 20 or so folks on right now. Uh, really looking forward to getting going. Uh, we still have just a couple more minutes and we will be getting started talking a little bit about consumer psychology and the future of food. I know that these are topics that you guys think about all the time, so I'm excited to be talking to you about them. So another minute or so and we will get going. And I'd particularly like to talk, uh, thank Build Up Dietitians for letting me participate in this Facebook Live event. Okay, just a few more seconds here and we will be off and running. Thank you for your patience, I appreciate it. Okay, well, it is noon and I'm gonna get started and I will uh, start by thanking Build Up Dietitians for allowing me to participate in this Facebook Live event. Uh, this is really my first time doing Facebook Live. I have done dozens and dozens of webinars and seminars and uh, conferences. I spoke to thousands of people, but uh, really first time for a Facebook Live event. And so uh, interesting experience for me. And I appreciate uh, Leah and everybody uh, working with me to make sure that I got the technology right. So uh, today is an interesting time in food. And I am Jack Bobo. I'm a food futurist and I'm the CEO of Futurity, which is a food foresight company. So I spend my time working with organizations to help them understand what does the future of food look like? What is consumer psychology all about? And what are the forces that shape the trends that other people are discussing? And so we're gonna talk about a little of that today. But I also want to let you know how you can find me beyond this conversation on social media. And you can do that, I'm at Futurity Food. Uh, if you were to go on Facebook, that's at Futurity F Food, F-U-T-U. R-I-T-Y, uh, for Futurity Food on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. So you can find me on all of those places or my website, futurityfood.com. So I hope you'll be joining me there as well. A little bit about my background. Um, I've only been uh, doing this position uh, as CEO of Futurity for a year. Uh, before that, I spent 13 years at the U.S. Department of State doing global food policy. And so I spent a little bit of time working on food policy in Africa, then a few years work covering Asia, then Europe, then I ran our global biotechnology program for a few years. And then my last few years, my only job was giving speeches. So I had an unlimited travel budget. I could travel anywhere in the world and just talk about the future of food, the role of science, and how do we better communicate to the public. And so it's something I'm really passionate about. And after that, I left, I joined a biotechnology company called Intrexon. You probably haven't heard of that, but it's the company behind the genetically engineered non-browning apples, the genetically engineered mosquitoes fighting Zika, the genetically engineered salmon, uh, animal cloning, all sorts of controversial things. Uh, but it was also a really exciting time. So I was head of communications and government affairs uh, for that company for about three and a half years uh, before start starting my own company. Um, but really, it was when I was at the State Department 
that I really started thinking about you know, consumer attitudes and how they shape people's opinions. Because while I was at the State Department, I began to realize that I actually couldn't convince anybody of anything with science. And you know, that's kind of disappointing for those of us who really love science. I have degrees in psychology, chemistry, biology, environmental science, and law. Don't be impressed. My wife has the PhD in our family. But you know, I really like science, but it just wasn't working. All it did was polarize audiences. Those who agreed with you agreed with you more. Those who disagreed, disagreed more. And so I was trying to figure out, well, how do you actually reach people? And so I started reading about cognitive psychology and behavioral economics and marketing and advertising and all of these things. And so it really changed how I approach conversations around food and agriculture. And these are probably a lot of things that you guys think about every day. And that's part of what uh, led me to conversations around the future of food and uh, where are we going? How do we sustainably and nutritiously feed the world? That's a really important question. But how do we actually bring people together towards a common goal of achieving that? Because when we look around today, what we really find is there are a lot of people that are sort of disagreeing about how we should do it, and they're undermining the other person rather than supporting each other to attain a common goal. So I like to tell people that my mission at Futurity is to figure out a way to de-escalate the tension in our food system so that we can all get about our business of saving the planet in our own way. And so part of what I want to talk to you today about is uh, consumer psychology. How do people think? And I know it's something that you guys are thinking about all the time. I normally don't get to speak to a uh, registered dietitian nutritionist, and so I'm really excited today to do that. Uh, normally I'm speaking to agriculture audiences, uh, academic audiences, scientists, and others, and doing that uh, all around the world. So what is it that we can really learn and do when it comes to consumer psychology? Well, I just started a uh, Food Fear series where I've been putting out blogs. I've uh, done five of the first uh, 10 blogs so far, and each one is looking at a different cognitive bias. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with cognitive biases. They're uh, heuristics that lead people to make consistent bad decisions about things. And the first article talks about confirmation bias. We're all familiar with confirmation bias. You know, it's that we tend to uh, underestimate information that's inconsistent with our beliefs and overestimate information or look for information that's consistent with our beliefs. Now, we're all pretty good at identifying confirmation and bias in others. We're not so good at identifying confirmation bias in ourselves. And so understanding how we can like build tools in order to uh, guard ourselves against our own biases is something that's important. And I cover that in the first article. Uh, the second one, I'm talking about nat the naturalness bias. And again, you know, when consumers probably say, oh, I only buy natural products, I'm sure it drives a lot of you guys crazy. And it drives all these scientists crazy as well, because we know that being natural is not the same as being good. I think coronavirus, salmonella, Zika, Ebola, all sorts of things in this world that are natural that will kill us. And yet, pretty much everybody, when they hear the word natural, they think puppies and rainbows and butterflies and all sorts of wonderful things. And then understanding the naturalness bias helps us to understand why people have wildly more positive feelings about a product just because the word natural is added to it. Uh, other topics that I think are really important in conversations today are things like the halo effect. And we see this in a lot of food purchases with natural products, the halo effect is at play. Uh, but we're also seeing that a lot today with plant-based foods and plant-based uh, proteins, uh, whether it's the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Burger. When you look at the nutrition, you know obviously they're, they're relatively similar, the nutrition of a, a regular hamburger and an Impossible Burger Beyond Burger. But 90 to 95% of consumers will say that they're purchasing it for health reasons. And that's because when they think plants, they think healthy. And that can lead people to potentially eat more of them than they would have a traditional hamburger. So just switching from animal-based products to plant-based products may or may not actually improve somebody's health. And so the halo effect is something that's uh, really relevant to how consumers think about food. And the more we understand that, the more we're going to be able to, for about ourselves, the more, again, we can guard against it. Because once you put the word low fat on a product, People assume it's low, low calorie. And so again, they may end up eating more of a product. Now, labeling is really important. And you, 
you often talk about that uh, as part of what you're doing, but understanding the psychology of those things and being able to articulate it to people, uh, I think is really valuable. Uh, another topic that I think is relevant in this day and age is decision fatigue. And again, I think we're, we're all familiar with the idea that you know, we shouldn't go shopping when we're hungry or tired, and that's because we're not as able to uh, make good decisions in that case. But in this day and age of COVID, where there's a lot of stress in our lives, again, that can lead to decision fatigue as well, and it may impact people's ability to make good decisions. And so all of these issues of consumer psychology are, are really important. Uh, the last article that I published uh, was on the dirty dozen. And again, whether or not you're worried about pesticide residues in food, there is a real danger that people go to the grocery store, they've heard about the dirty dozen, and there's research that shows that particularly low income people are just confused. So it's like they know they should maybe avoid some products because of pesticide residues. They don't remember which ones it was. So they actually end up purchasing less fruits and vegetables uh, because of that. And obviously that's not the goal of the dirty dozen to decrease or depress uh, fruit and vegetable consumption. So we have to understand consumer psychology to know whether or not advice that's being provided will actually result in the goals that we're trying to achieve. And so I've taken all of these ideas and I'm putting them together into a book. And that book uh, is called The Halo Effect and how the decisions we make can be impacted uh, by the way our mind works. And that, uh, that book is actually available for pre-order. I will uh, type that into the comments here so you can uh, go to, to find that if you want to. Uh, and you can pre-order it right now. But the other thing that I'm doing that I think is really exciting, maybe of interest to you guys, is that I'm taking these articles and I'm working with a friend of mine, Nick Syke, who owns uh, No Ideas uh, Media, that's K-N-O-W, No Ideas Media. And he's taking each of my articles and he's turning them into a video and those videos are now available. And again, I will provide links to that uh, after the program ends right here. But it's really great because, you know, in five to 10 minutes, he's sort of condensing all of those ideas into a really entertaining and engaging way. And I'm hoping that the articles, the video, and the book will be a tool or a resource that dietitians and nutritionists and others will be able to use to help consumers understand how the brain works and lead to better decisions. Uh, because right now, you know, we've got this really odd situation in which consumers have never known more about nutrition and they've never been more obese. And a lot of this has to do with how the mind works and also the choice architecture. How, how does our environment influence us? And so understanding consumer psychology, choice architecture, and then combining that with nutrition information, I think are going to have a big impact on actually changing people's lives. Because when you think about it, you know, nobody gained 20 or 30 pounds in a year. So, you know, why would they, why should they expect that they're going to lose 20 or 30 pounds in a year? What happened is that we gained one or two pounds a year for 20 or 30 years and we ended up where we are. And, you know, that's because portion shot size has increased, how we shopped has changed, um, where we eat has all changed. So all of these things in our environment have changed. Uh, you know, nobody knew more about nutrition in 1960, and yet somehow people were uh, less obese and overweight. And so if we can begin to figure out how to reverse some of these trends, get, and that's, again, one of the situations right now that we have with COVID, people are at home, people are shopping in grocery stores, people are eating around the dinner table. Is there a way to take advantage of this particular moment in time to begin to teach people the skills around cooking and food preparation and food purchasing that might have a lasting impact, not just you know, for the next five, uh, few months, but the next few years and decades into the future. So uh, really, uh, really uh, interesting moment in history. And also I think it's, it's important to think about sort of why this particular moment is like so important because for 10,000 years of human civilization and agriculture, farmers were only asked to produce more food but we're at that one unique moment in all of human history where we need to produce better food as well as more food. And so we're at this transition moment. And so that's part of why it's gonna be so complicated. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge people that are uh, typing in, uh, coming from India and other places around the world. Uh, I'm going to take one second here and I'm going to uh, put in the uh, 
link to the to the book if you guys are interested in uh, pre-ordering that so you can do that and then I will take a look at some of the additional questions that have come in as well okay so I just uh, popped in the link uh, to the book okay uh, okay so uh, one of the questions that came in you know is like are there things that you can do to help uh, consumers in these person-to-person -person conversations. And I think that it, it will actually be enormously helpful when you're talking to consumers to help them understand the consumer psychology because, you know, it's unfortunate that people sometimes blame themselves for, you know, their inability to stick to a diet. And a lot of it comes down to psychology because the more we think about the food we eat, you know, the more it's like on our minds all the time. You know, when we're counting calories, we're always thinking about food. And yet, again, back in 1960, nobody was counting calories. Nobody was thinking about the amount of food they ate. Nobody was looking at portion sizes. And so the more we're obsessing about things, the less healthy we seem to be. And people should understand that, you know, this is just how our minds work, that, you know, when somebody puts something like low fat, you know, it's not your fault that you're eating more of it, you know, because you feel like it's probably low calorie. Well, you know, our mind, the halo effect is leading us to, to those conclusions. And so the more you can work with consumers to understand how their mind is working in many ways, working against them, then I think people will actually feel like, you know, it's not all their fault, and if they can understand how their minds operate, they will be better able to follow with the advice that you're providing. And you know, it is a, a really important advice and the things that people need to be doing. And uh, so, there are a couple other things uh, I also want to make sure I, I don't miss out on uh, some of the resources that are out there that I think uh, are helpful. Uh, I. I particularly like the book Nudge by Thaler and Sunstein. Uh, it's one of those that uh, is all about behavioral economics and how we can use defaults as a way of changing uh, people's actions and attitudes. And I, I think that's a really great resource. Uh, there's the uh, oh, the Better Buying Lab from uh, the World Resources Institute, which again talks about how uh, food names and communication influences behavior. And I think that's also quite useful. Uh, but Perhaps a, an interesting or odd uh, suggestion is a book called The Wizard and the Prophet. And this is by Charles Mann. And it's the biography of two people, uh, Norman Borlaug and William Vogt. Norman Bo Borlaug's the father of the Green Revolution. William Vogt, in many ways, is the father of the environmental movement. And the reason I recommend this book is that they really represent two different phil philosophical trends in how people think about the food system, agriculture, and the world around us. Norman Borlaug fundamentally believed that science and technology could deliver benefits that would help to save us from hunger and malnutrition. William Vogt believed that we really needed to produce, uh, use less and less resources, that we were just over consuming, that that was going to undermine our future. And so you could sort of re reduce this to the idea that, you know, is science the solution to our problem or the problem to be solved? And those are two different philosophical views of the world. And as you're talking to people, you will find that they tend to fall into one of those two camps. You know, there isn't a right or wrong camp, but whichever camp the person that you're speaking to is in, that's the language you need to use because, you know, it isn't going to help to focus on scientific solutions to problems if the person sort of fundamentally believes that we should there should be fewer of us eating less in a, a less impactful way. We need to meet people where they are. We're not going to get them to change their philosophical approach. And, you know, that's important to, to recognize that, that one, we can't do it and we probably shouldn't do it either. And this is something that I work with a, a lot of organizations, again, trying to de-escalate that tension so that people can get about their business of saving the planet. And I see this a lot in the debates these days between, uh, you know, cattlemen and livestock uh, ranchers and livestock producers and those that are promoting a plant-based diet. And there's this feeling that, you know, the, the people that are promoting a plant-based diet are trying to put the ranchers out of business. And, you know, to be clear, a lot of the language they're using is, you know, this is our mission because they have a moral feeling that, that that's something that needs to happen. But it doesn't have to be that kind of tension. 
because between today and 2050, we need to produce 50 or 60% more food, by some estimates, 100% more protein. So we have a $2 trillion uh, protein market today, and it's gonna go to $3 trillion just by 2050. And so, you know, when you think about that, you know, that's a huge challenge that we have, and we need to do it with the same resources that we have today. And so there's this opportunity for plant-based diets, you know, to grow, to become a trillion dollar industry in just 30 years. And if they did, not a single cattleman or dairy producer would go out of business. And so, you know, the challenge isn't one or the other, it's how can we reduce the footprint of agriculture and make it more sustainable while also increasing uh, the nutritional health of people around the world. And, you know, we need to keep that nutritional goal in mind. And as you engage both with consumers, but also with conservation groups, because there, there often is this feeling that there's a tension between food production and the environment. And I don't think people understand that food production is the biggest driver of global deforestation, no doubt about it. But how we produce food will determine whether or not there are any forests available at all. And so this comes to the sort of a question of sustainability. And it's something that you may end up engaging with consumers about because they may want to understand what's the environmental footprint of the foods or the nutrition or things that you're recommending. And that may be something that you're, you may not have the background. You feel comfortable talking about that point. But one thing you might be able to help them to understand is that there's this feeling about sustainability. And when consumers think about sustainability, they tend to think about local sustainability, reducing the amount of fertilizer and pesticides and insecticides and other things in order to reduce the amount of impact of a farm on the planet. And that makes total sense. But there's also a feeling of global sustainability. Now, if I produce a lot more food on a little piece of land, well, then we don't need to cut down as much forest in Brazil or some other place. Now, that might actually have negative consequences for my farm, but it has positive global consequences for forests somewhere else. And so there's that tension between local sustainability and global sustainability. And the reality is that they're both necessary. We need to do better at the local level, but we need to recognize that the more intensive our agriculture is, the fewer hectares of forest or acres of forest need to uh, be eliminated. And to put that into perspective, uh, the because of intensification of agriculture over the last 50 years, that has uh, resulted in a billion hectares of forest that were not deforested because we tripled the amount of food on the land we have. So we didn't have to cut down a billion acres or hectares of forest because of that. So intensification protects forests. It doesn't destroy forests. Um, but it also has a negative local impact. And so understanding that tension. So consumers should feel fine whether they're eating organic or GMO or other things because one has a global sustainability component, the other has a local sustainability component, and both are actually necessary uh, to the future sustainability of the planet. And I wanna get into a little bit, uh, and also uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to send them, uh, would, would love to take them. Also, feel free to reach out to me on any of the social media uh, channels, uh, connect to me on LinkedIn, any of those things uh, after this is over, because you know, I'd love to continue this dialogue uh, beyond just the, the presentation here today. So really looking forward to that. Uh, but I wanted to get back to that question of organic versus GMO versus intensive. And again, people tend to think of them as competing, but I don't really see it that way. Uh, if you're an organic farmer in America today, you're taking advantage of big data in order to become a better farmer, but that big data doesn't really exist in order to support small organic farms. It exists in order to support large industrial farms, but you're a beneficiary of that. Because it exists, it helps you to become a better farmer. On the other hand, if you're a large industrial farmer, you may be using cover crops or low-till, no-till agriculture, well, those ideas all generate it in the organic systems because some organic farmer believed in her heart it was the right thing to do. And because of that, big data came along and proved her right. And once there was evidence that cover crops could uh, have an economic benefit, 
larger farmers began to adopt those practices. So it's that uh, movement of ideas from one system to the other that makes our system better. So it's the diversity of the food system is the strength of our food system. And you also may hear a lot that our food system is broken. And again, that's something that, you know, I find a little bit puzzling because when somebody says something is broken, you think, well, when was it not broken? Was it not broken 10 years ago? Was it not broken 20 years ago? I mean, just tell me at what point was it not broken? Because today about 12% of all the people on the planet are gonna go to bed hungry and that's totally unacceptable. But 50 years ago, 36% of all the people on the planet went to bed hungry. So 12% is certainly better than a third of all the people on the planet. And so things are not bad and getting worse, they're good and getting better. And because of that, you know, how we frame this conversation is so critically important. Uh, because if things are bad and getting worse, that means farmers are the problem to be solved. If things are good and getting better, well, that means farmers and those in the food sector are the solution to our problem. And we need, if we want them to be work with us to solve these problems of hunger and malnutrition and obesity and uh, sustainability, well, you know, we can't tell them they're evil and that, you know, they're not doing their job. I mean, you know, let's be realistic. They're, they're feeding 7.8 billion people every single day. Uh, 365 days a year. So how do we bring people together to focus on solutions? And, you know, a lot of that has to do with, you know, also bringing the conversation around food and the nutritionists and dietitians, you know, you are the people on the front lines of those conversations and can help to be a bridge between consumers, how they think about food and connecting to those that are working on the food system because you know we have the best food system in the history of the planet that may be true but it's also the worst it will ever be because it's going to be better tomorrow and the day after and the day after and so there's just nothing inconsistent with saying that you know our food system is screwed up but it's never been better and you know we absolutely need to work hard in order to fix the problems that we see um, i hear a lot of people talking about how COVID has demonstrated how broken our food system is and we need to go back to more diversified uh, production instead of having a small number of companies that are uh, producing our food. We need to have uh, a more diverse, a robust system. Well, uh, when, when we uh, think about that, uh, you know, last year in China, there was the outbreak of uh, swine fever. And because of that, uh, it impacted them but mostly because they had such a diverse system where they had lots of small operations of hog producers. And so, you know, the current crisis we have today may suffer because we have uh, a more uh, consolidated food system. But I, just a year ago, a different food system, you know, was greatly damaged because it had uh, a diversified food system. And they're actually moving more towards a consolidated system that we have in the United States today. And so, um, I would like to, to thank uh, Build Up Dietitians uh, uh, for pointing out that, uh, that I'm using the wrong terminology uh, talking about uh, dietitians. And so uh, when, so the language that we use is critically important. And so whenever I make a mistake, I, I appreciate somebody pointing it out to me so that I understand how to, to use the right language because, you know, you can offend people unnecessary, uh, unintentionally. Uh, and you may not be able to recover from that. And so uh, hopefully I have some friends that uh, will allow me to get over this. But it's the same thing when we're talking about farmers and we're talking about others in the food sector um, that we're often, they're being, they're, they feel like they're under attack. And we need their help in order to make this system better. And so, you know, that's part of what we need to do is learn how to communicate in a better, more effective way. And we can only do that by listening and listening to uh, what others are telling us and then trying to incorporate that into uh, our daily language so that we can build bridges and not burn them. And too often today, it seems like people are really focused on burning bridges instead of building them. And so again, if there are any last minute questions uh, before we wrap up, uh, I would love to, to take them. And, uh, you know, if there aren't, I'm looking forward to 
uh, continuing this conversation uh, beyond uh, the confines of Facebook Live. I'm spending a lot of my time, you know, talking to people these days about, you know, how is COVID going to change our food system? And, you know, I think in some ways it's going to accelerate some old trends and it's going to decelerate or reverse other trends. And so one that's being reversed is eating at home. Um, but some that are being accelerated, I think you're, you're probably very familiar with uh, things like uh, purchasing online. Uh, you know, we went from about 5% of consumers purchasing their food online in February to about 40% having purchased something online, you know, just a month later. And that's huge, but it's also important for other reasons because often getting people to do something for the very first time is incredibly difficult. And once they've done it for the first time, then everything changes. So we had compressed into the, a single month the amount of adoption of online purchases of food that might have taken five or 10 years. And so as you think about this moment in time, it's worth thinking about how can we take advantage of the moment to accelerate trends uh, that would benefit people? And how can we decelerate or reverse trends that may be negative uh, for nutritional health? And a lot of that will have to do with how we communicate about this moment to the public. You know, there are two food futures, at least, that are out there. And I've been talking to the agricultural community. I just had an article published earlier this week in, on the Farm Bureau's website. And out of this could come a feeling that uh, the, this current crisis was caused by a broken food system and people leave even more concerned and confused about the food they eat. Or out of this could come a recognition that better health and nutrition can help to boost our immune systems, protect us from disease, and it can be a positive factor in our health. And so it can either make people feel better about the food they eat and focused on eating healthy, or it can make them more worried and concerned. And those are both options that could come out of this. And so we, we need to figure out, you know, which of those futures we're going, we want to live with. Uh, so when it comes to uh, people that I tend to follow. Uh, well, I think we all know uh, Build Up Dietitians is a, is a great place. Uh, other people, though, more maybe in the, the food and ag world, uh, I, a lot of you have probably been following Botany Geek on Twitter. He's fantastic. Uh, there, I think uh, Tamar Haspel uh, from the Washington Post is a great writer on food and ag. Nathaniel Johnson at Grist is wonderful. So there are a lot of people out there that you can follow to sort of feel more confident in communicating about the food and ag system that may be separate from what you're already communicating on the nutrition and health side. And so uh, I think Twitter is a great place to have those conversations with experts in the field. Um, for me, LinkedIn is where I go to uh, really keep my connections and build my network. And from a professional standpoint, you know, I hope that all of you are on uh, LinkedIn, you're using it every day because it's a it's an incredibly useful resource, and you know I've just started getting more involved in Facebook and Instagram because I want to reach the consumer that you are probably working with uh, every day, and so you know I'm trying to go where the the people that I'm trying to influence are, and so I would welcome your thoughts on who I should be following in the food and nutrition world. And so uh, before I conclude, I'd just like to remind you of uh, how you can find me on social media. Uh, that's Futurity Food, uh, at Futurity Food, uh, F-U-T-U-R-I-T-Y, Futurity. Sounds like a made up word, but it's not. Uh, so at Futurity Food on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, uh, and futurityfood.com. Uh, I hope you'll consider uh, pre-ordering my book. I hope that you will send me feedback, feedback on the articles and check out those videos by Nick Syke. They're amazing. He's doing a terrific job. I'm excited to see uh, the rest of this series. So thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation offline.